Good morning and welcome to the Paris and Marrakesh seminar jointly organized by Civic Exchange, BEC, and University of Science and Technology. I am Maura Wong, CEO of Civic Exchange, and I'm honored to be here and kick off this event with a short introduction that hopefully will set the scene for the two panel discussions today. In December 2015, the world celebrated the reaching of the Paris Agreement. In a nutshell, the Paris Agreement is a commitment <coughs> to limit the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. It allows each country to decide for itself its own emission target. Perhaps we should note that in 2016, the temperature is already close to 1.2 degrees Celsius above the uh, Paris Agreement level, and 2016 is likely the hottest year on record. What is Marrakesh, or COP22? Marrakesh is a transition point between the negotiation phase and the implementation phase of the world's response to climate change. 11 months after the Paris Agreement was reached, it entered into force, much earlier and faster than expectation. When the Paris when the Marrakesh conference ended on November 18th, 111 countries ratified the Paris Agreement, representing over three quarters of the world's emissions. Going forward, there are key milestones for implementation agreements. In 2018, and importantly, in 2020, when 2030 targets are supposed to be reset, and 100 billion US dollars per annum is supposed to be available, mostly from rich countries to help achieve the, t the objectives. Despite the momentum that led to the earlier than expected activation of the Paris Agreement, the transition also runs into new uncertainties. Two of them are Brexit and the US presidential election. I won't talk much about Brexit, and maybe Esther later on will touch on it. Robert will also talk about the impact of Trump. But let me just flash up one slide. President-elect Trump has nominated Scott Pruitt to head the EPA. Scott Pruitt is known to be both a climate change denier as well as an enemy to EPA, having tried to sue the agency many times without success. In the words of a speaker at a recent talk I attended, having Scott Pruitt as head of the EPA, if it gets confirmed by the Congress, is like having a pedophile run a kindergarten. Despite the shock, parties at Marrakesh have put up a brave face and collectively declared that the extraordinary momentum on climate change worldwide is irreversible. <coughs> and there is much truth to that statement. Two positive trends have been happening in the world. Coal is losing out to natural gas because cost of gas is competitive and gas is less polluting than coal. Coal-fired power plants in the US are being shut down and not replaced with new ones. The economics is such that many people believe, at least in the United States, that it no longer makes commercial sense to build new coal-fired power stations. In China, inefficient coal-fired plants built in urban centers are also being phased out, but unfortunately, new ones are still being built. In both China and the US, partly because of the trend to move away from the most polluting fossil fuels, but partly also due to slowing economy, fossil fuel use has begun to come down recently. We certainly hope this trend will continue. Another positive trend that is happening everywhere is the emergence of renewable energy. Again, it has to do with plummeting costs of renewables, especially with solar. The cost of power generation with solar is now competitive to oil, and the cost of power generation from solar and onshore wind is expected to fall further. While coal and fossil fuels are still the largest source of electricity generation today, over time, that could change. In 2015, renewables surpassed coal to become the largest source of global electricity capacity. Note, capacity does not equate to generation, because with wind and solar, it may not be possible to generate power 365 days a year. But if renewable growth continues, it will become more and more mainstream. The question is, who will provide the leadership on climate change going forward? China has done much in pushing renewable energies, but it is unlikely to want to lead this alone if the US falls back. Will India do it? 
It has made considerable pledges, but will it deliver? EU, it has a very important role to play in climate change, but what's going to happen to EU? And who within the EU will take the lead? Last but not least, let's not forget non-state actors. Like the big corporates, 471 companies with $8 trillion US dollars market cap have made commitments on climate change. Google is already the largest corporate buyer of renewable energy in the world and announced that they intend to be 100% renewable energy by 2017. Apple, IKEA, Facebook, Starbucks, etc., have made similar announcements to support renewable energy. Purchasing renewable energy is not the only thing businesses can do to help provide leadership in climate change. The first step for everyone should be to start with new energy efficiency. Carbon offset and pricing are also an important topic, and you will hear about it later today. It is important that the commitment to climate change mitigation continues, and it is necessary that not only countries continue to honor their commitments, but state as well as city governments take it upon themselves to do more. And businesses, the private sector, also contribute so much, can contribute so much, as exemplified by the companies I mentioned earlier. I shall stop here and thank you once again for coming to